Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. My name is Andrew Shikiar, a lead marketing here at FIDO Alliance. As you may have heard, uh, FIDO 2 project was launched last month. This was a, a much anticipated milestone for the Alliance uh, that stands to usher in a new wave of product and deployment innovations. Uh, many of these were showcased actually by our members at RSA conference, where several of you may have attended. So we're very pleased to have all of you today on this webinar so we can give you added insights on FIDO 2, in including a series of demonstrations that will showcase cross-environment interoperability for FIDO 2 authentication. Today's speakers and uh, QA question and answer panelists that you'll learn about later uh, represent some of FIDO's most ardent backers and, and platform innovators. Uh, speakers today are Brent McDowell, Executive Director of FIDO Alliance, Christian Brand uh, of Google, and Anoush Sabori of, of Microsoft. Uh, later on, uh, Derek Hansen of Ubico and Ralph Lindemann of Knock Knock Labs will be joining the Q&A session, uh, which will be open for your questions towards the end of the webinar. Uh, so before we start, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, yes, this will be recorded, and the slides and replay will be shared with you afterwards, so that you'll get a follow-up email with links to the replay and to the, and to the slides. Um, second, we will do Q&A um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, the way to do this is to ask questions in the GoToWebinar cl client. Uh, you'll see a, a dialog box here towards the bottom of, of your webinar client. You can ask questions midstream uh, during the webinar. We'll answer those as we can. Uh, others we'll, we'll save up for the open Q&A at the end. Um, and third, not, but not, last but not least, you'll see a survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, please do take a few moments to fill this out as your feedback is really important to us and it helps us shape our webinar program moving forward. So with that, uh, let's get things started. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Brett McDowell, FIDO, FIDO's Executive Director. Brett. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks everybody for showing up for our webinar today and all of those who are gonna play this later. I expect there's gonna be a lot of downloads of this. There's been tremendous interest in FIDO2 uh, in fact, when we uh, first were able to give these demonstrations, it was at the RSA Security Conference, and uh, it was standing room only. They actually had to turn people away, and that was on a Friday morning, uh, where normally uh, you don't get uh, a packed house. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start off by giving you just some context setting, background information, just quick level setting on what FIDO is and where we're at, and then turn it over and spend the bulk of our time actually going through the demos. So FIDO Alliance was formed to solve the world's password problem. Here are just some data points of why we think there's a password problem. Uh, it is responsible for over 80% of data breaches. Um, we've got increasingly effective uh, uh, you know, um, success rate with phishing attacks. And the number of data breaches have increased 45% year over year. Uh, in addition to the security and fraud reasons uh, that we need something better than passwords, there's just the usability problems. They're clumsy, hard to remember, and, they need, and sometimes you even get asked to change them. So people reuse them everywhere, adding to the security problem. But even outside of that, we needed something that was faster uh, to authenticate with um, because of we still get checkout abandonment rates that are unacceptable uh, when a password authentication pops up. So the vision for the FIDO Alliance was to come up with a fundamentally new system, a new technology, and a new user experience that for the first time in authentication, we would have something that was more secure than what users were already doing and simultaneously easier to use. Uh, this is in stark contrast to um, the, the old model where you simply added more friction to the experience. So it was a consequence of making it more secure. We now can get more secure while reducing the friction, actually giving the user something easier um, that they can do faster and they don't have to deal with the passwords uh, memory problem or typing them in. And that fundamental system is open standards because we, we could not do this with any one product. Um, we had to uh, reach the same scale that passwords do. And the only way to do that was with open standards. And they're based on public key cryptography. So your new credential is a public-private key pair. The real critical point of that is that the private key is created on your device and is never shared. So we get out of credential sharing, which means we defeat all those social engineering attacks. 
You can't be tricked into giving away your secret because you literally cannot give away your secret. Um, and for usability, a single gesture strategy. So we're gonna ask the user to just touch something, look at something, and be authenticated. So this is kind of the only technical diagram you're gonna to see today. So we're not gonna go deep into the technology, but if you have technical questions, we have the right people on the call to answer them at the end. So here's just a diagram of what I just explained. The user has a capability literally in their hand. Uh, this is the FIDO authenticator. Uh, this is what we've added to the authentication flow. Don't think of this as a thing, think of it as a capability. And this is a capability that can live within a security key or a smartphone or a PC or tablet. And it is the ability to create these key pairs, protect the private key and share the public key that matches that. And we're doing that on a per credential basis. So this isn't one key across all of your accounts. This is a unique public private key pair for every account. And so that when you do need to re-authenticate, the application will send a challenge to the device the device will perform user verification, and once it has passed user verification, then it has the authorization to sign the challenge with the correct private key. That signed challenge goes back to the server, and you're authenticated because they have the public key to verify the signature. So that's true for our multi-factor flows. In our second factor, our single second factor flow, you would enter your username and password, and FIDO is replacing that second factor uh, as opposed to replacing all of it. Um, but with, with FIDO2, it's very easy to replace all those factors. Here are some of the companies, and it's just a relatively small sample of the companies that are already deploying services. So this isn't a list of, of companies bringing solutions to market. This is a collection of companies that are authenticating consumers at scale today. And in some cases, they've been doing so for quite some time. Um, so get companies like you know, Google and Microsoft, they're going to tell you about what they're doing uh, today and show you uh, what's coming. Uh, also, companies like you know, eBay and, and BC Card and T-Mobile and PayPal and Cigna, they're using the, that biometric on your phone. And even though the user might not be aware that they're doing FIDO, they've added FIDO for added security. And by the way, um, most of the, the companies here, especially along the bottom, uh, this is an opportunity to give a shout out to one of our participants today, um, Knock Knock Labs. Uh, all the companies here on the bottom half of the slide are actually their customers. And as well, Ubico has enabled most of the uh, two-factor authentication solutions that you see in one way or another. So what is the FIDO2 project? So now I'm going to talk about the state of the standardization. So everything that I just showed you, all those live deployments, um, again, some of them going all the way back to 2014, they have used either FIDO UAF specifications or FIDO U2F specifications. Uh, the FIDO2 project was an effort to say, all right, can we come up with a protocol that's optimized for platform support? You know, we have hundreds of millions of mobile phones, for example, that already ship out of the box with FIDO UAF support but can we get all of them? Can we get ubiquity? Um, every Android device, every Windows device, every web browser, because then we really can start moving past passwords. And so the design uh, was to optimize for operating system and browser support, and it comes in two specification sets. CTAP is client to authenticator protocol. Uh, this is uh, still, developed within the FIDO Alliance itself. And this is device to device protocol, local, so that you can use an external device as your authenticator, regardless of the, the primary device that you're running the application on. And WebAuthn, uh, which we've contributed specifications into W3C and continue to participate there. Uh, this is the web API uh, that brings FIDO authentication to web browsers. And the W3C's recent announcement was that the WebAuthn specifications have reached candidate recommendation, which essentially means they're fit for commercial use and it's a call for implementation. And those implementations have already begun as you're about to see. 
Uh, I also want to mention a little bit about the participation in this effort demonstrated here on the right. Uh, so I'll let Google and Microsoft uh, speak for, for their engagement because they're here today. Um, and we also have Mozilla Firefox, which has recently announced their uh, web auth and compliance. And also we have Apple. So the WebKit development team uh, who builds the Safari browser, they're now participants in that working group. And on their public roadmap, they're currently evaluating uh, their support for web auth and. So it looks like we're going to have ubiquity across the web uh, before the end of the year. So this is uh, where I'm going to turn it over, and we're going to start seeing the demonstrations. Uh, just You're going to see demonstrations from the Chrome browser, the Edge browser, and the Firefox browser today. Uh, we're going to see uh, servers being used from that are provided by uh, Knock Knock Labs and PayPal. On the biometric side, you're going to see Android fingerprint capabilities that are native to Android and the Windows Hello system, which runs across all Windows 10 devices. And you're going to see security keys uh, being used from Yubico. And with that, I would like to turn it over uh, to Christian, who's going to introduce the first demo and take you through it. Christian? Thanks, Brad. Uh, good morning, folks. So the first demo um, that we are going to see here this morning is uh, how FIDO2 is built into everyday devices like PCs and phones, uh, allowing you to quickly re-authenticate and re-verify your identity to websites using some built-in authenticator. Uh, so let's take a look at how this works on an Android device. So I'm on a website here. Um, I've got an Android device with a fingerprint sensor. I want to buy something. I go through a standard checkout flow, select some product I want to buy. At this point, I have a iPhone here for 10 cents, um, some cleaning kit. I go ahead, I click checkout. I check out with PayPal. PayPal, this demo is integrated with the WebAuthn APIs, and PayPal then sends a WebAuthn call through to Chrome. Chrome talks to Android. Uh, talks to the fingerprint sensor, cryptographically verifies my identity by sending a signature back to the back end of PayPal. And at this point in time, I have completed authentication and I can continue through the uh, through the payment flow, uh, thereby checking out and, and getting the item that I, that I wanted to buy. Um, so if we kind of talk about uh, what we've just seen here and what happened behind the scenes, um, so really what we saw is that PayPal served up a web page, as we said, using a W3C WebAuthn call. Um, the WebAuthn call, in essence, asked for a cryptographic signature. Um, so because Chrome implements WebAuthn and FIDO, Chrome then connects the call to the underlying Android capability, um, which is basically our fingerprint confirmation here of the user uh, that's tied to a specific key. So it's important here to note again that the fingerprint is never actually sent back to any relying party. The fingerprint is validated locally on the device it releases a key pair and that key pair or signature um, and basically using that key pair uh, and the data that came in the challenge a uh, signature is generated and the response is sent back to PayPal proving that you have possession of a key but never actually revealing said key back to um, the relying party in this case PayPal um, so over to Anoush to show the same demo on Windows Thank you so much. Hi, guys. Good morning. Uh, likewise, I'm going to show you Windows 10. Um, can you guys hear me well? I assume yes. Um, Windows 10 PC, Windows Hello can act as a FIDO authenticator as well. And now I'm, I can pay for stuff on my PC with just a simple smile or my fingerprint. Uh, fingerprint. Let's see how it works. And the demo already started. So this is Edge. Um, running um, the same website, um, the user navigates to check out the same clinic lens. And as Christian mentioned, he click, decides to uh, use PayPal for the payment. And uh, the, this website shows up that allows the user to use their face in this case to authenticate. And um, once they're authenticated, they can finish the payment. So what happens under the scene, as Christian said, is basically PayPal is using a web page that is using web auth and W3C calls. And we have implemented that uh, as part of uh, Edge. Edge connects to the call to the underlying Windows capability of Windows. And basically, in this case, the face camera authenticates the user and allows access to credential. 
without ever that credential leaving the system or the biometric template leaving the system. As you can see this from this demo, and it's, you, it's a very similar experience across both, um, this brings a very intuitive experience. Um, this is an experience that people only see on a particular platform today, but the same experience is going to be available uh, to cross-platform via the power of open standards. Um, so what we just basically saw is how Windows and Android devices themselves can be used as a built-in authentic indicator and um, to, to power everyday experience like checkout right and, and Christian talked about how this works under the cover um, next we're going to see how you can use an um, external dedicated FIDO authenticator as a second factor to complete the strong authentication sign into a website we're going to show it um, working exactly the same across multiple browsers and platform. Um, so we have this person called Tim. He uses his bank website from multiple devices and that he owns at home and work. And he does not want to be fished. So he uses this FIDO 2.0 standard token in Yubico, which his bank supports. This token um, is basically from Yubico. Let's see how this is done in Edge, right? This is the video of how the experience will look like. Uh, so he types in, if you click on the video, yeah, so basically, yeah, he navigates to the, the banking website, he types in um, his username, password to sign in, and then he's asked to uh, insert his device and uh, press the button uh, on the device and he's logged in. And um, so as you can see, the experience is very fluid. Um, by simply touching the, the Yubico in this uh, screen, he's already signed in and he, he has access to his account and he can see all the money he has. Now let's say he goes to another device, say home, and want to use the files. Um, let's watch to see the same exact experience on a, on a, a different browser. So this is Firefox. Um, the user navigates, um, if you can play the video, um, the user navigates to the same uh, website again and he needs to type in his uh, username and password, which he does. Again, this is Tim. And once you click on sign in, he's requested to basically, um, you know, touch the security key, um, which, you know, he does at this point and now he's signed into the website and he can see the account balance the same way. Um, so with that I'm going to pass it back to Christian to show the same experience on, on Chrome. All right, thanks Anish. So here if we look at the exact same demo this is a user on his Chromebook at home wants to sign in same website same experience uh, user goes ahead uh, if we can start the video, uh, user goes ahead, types in user ID, uh, goes ahead, types in password. Once I've done that, we should uh, be asked to enter our uh, key, our touch our key. In this case, it's an authenticator made by Yubico, and the user is signed in as trade for this map. And inside here, if we need step up authentication as a bank, go ahead, try to do some transaction that requires a step up click the send money button. Again, I'm being asked to touch the token, click the button on the uh, on the token, and at that point, the transaction is successfully concluded. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about what happened here behind the scenes, right? Um, so, really what we saw here is a um, server, in this case, it was implemented by Knock Knock Labs, uh, that implemented the demo banking website on top of their web open and fight is capable server um, and the server just in the case as in the case of the, the earlier paypal demo the server threw up a web open enabled web page for a login um, at that point in time um, the browser responds the browser um, firstly recognizes that this is a web open javascript call and of course it's the exact same call that's the important thing here it's the exact same call whether you're using chrome Firefox, Edge, whether it's maybe even a mobile browser, it's the exact same call that gets sent to the browser. And the browser, because it implements the standard level thing that interprets this call, 
um, because all of these browsers, of course, implemented the WebAuthn standard, um, then they routed the signature request of the WebAuthn call through to the specific authenticator. In this case, it was a discrete Yubico device implementing FIDO2 over USB. Um, and of course, these experiences also works across Bluetooth, low energy, um, and NFC. But in this demo, we use the USB token. Um, and at that point in time, the token responded with the uh, relevant signature and sent that back to the uh, um, to the relying party, in this case, the knock-knock server. Um, now, beyond the interoperability and the simple user experience, it's very important to remember uh, that this experience is inherently designed to be non-fashable, right? Um, it's not just that you saw something really, really simple, right? No codes to enter, nothing to do except for press a button. It's also that you saw something that was fundamentally more secure than the status quo in multi-factor authentication today. Um, if you, for example, had an OTP in the exact same situation, right, a one-time password, those can be fished, right? And in fact, they are fished today. Um, it's not that we're saying OTP is, you know, fundamentally bad. It's just that, um, you know, if you have the option today, um, opting for something like security keys, opting for something like FIDO, um, that gives you that added uh, benefit over the standard uh, 2SV technologies or multi-factor technologies, which then also um, brings in this component that is highly uh, phishing resistant. Um, so if you decide to build something like a Bitcoin wallet or a banking website, or in general, anything that's kind of high value, where you worry about the clear and present danger of phishing, you actually have a way of protecting your user now that's ubiquitous, um, implement FIDO to implement WebAuthn, um, and use an external authenticator just in the same way that you saw it uh, happening right now. Over to Brett. Thank you, Christian and Anish. You know, it's it's funny those those demos uh, go by a lot more quickly when uh, when when you've recorded them on a video. Uh, so uh, when we gave when we gave them live, you know, there's a few a lot of other steps involved. So uh, we're going to have a lot of time here for Q and A, but let's first wrap up what it was that we saw. So the you've got FIDO2 compliant platforms um, that have enabled what you need on the client side. And that includes the browser as well as the devices with authenticators um, that the browser runs on. And in, in cases where uh, there isn't an authenticator on that device, you can have your own authenticator, this external uh, security key form factor being you know, what the market's really going with. Um, and what you have to implement to enable your site is you know, your, your application server has to be able to process the um, the FIDO2 signatures, to your page has to call the, the uh, browser API, and that's it. It is a relatively light lift uh, for, for any company to add this ability to their website. Um, and not only are you seeing some of this pre-production uh, activity, but we gave this demo for the first time about a month ago, and since then, we've already had a number of in-production announcements. And maybe we'll get into more of that on Q&A um, and more yet to come. So the ecosystem's growing. You can now bank on ubiquitous support on the client side. If that's something that you are waiting for, if you were wondering, well, I don't know if my users have one of these FIDO-enabled devices already or not, you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's in every browser, so certainly the, the web support is there, and it's coming to every modern operating system uh, for native app support as well. So on the note of uh, ubiquitous client support, we're introducing the FIDO Universal Server Certification. Uh, this is our answer for backwards compatibility. So whether you've if you're already implemented uh, UAF or U2F, you know, this provides a clean path forward to support all the new FIDO2 clients and devices uh, by simply making sure that your server infrastructure meets the universal server requirements. Um, or if you are just getting started and you're looking to deploy FIDO with the greatest amount of coverage for your user base, then universal server is gonna give that to you. It's gonna give you all the new FIDO2 uh, client-side supported devices as well as UAF and U2F. And I should say that FIDO2 has protocol-level uh, backward support 
or U2F. So uh, those U2F security keys are going to work with any FIDO2 deployment. So here, we're going to leave this page up for a bit. Uh, this is uh, some references for you. Uh, you might want to go and bookmark, in particular, the FIDO2 information page, phytoalliance.org slash FIDO2. Um, there, we have a lot of resources now, and we're adding more all the time. We'll be uh, adding pointers to the different developer communities uh, from uh, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla, and you see the Mozilla uh, developer URL is here as well. And of course, these slides are going to be available, so you can just uh, come back to these URLs later if you want to. And we also have our own open community of developers, the, the FIDO dev list, and that is not limited to members of the FIDO Alliance. Anyone can sign up uh, for the FIDO dev list, it's just an open public mail list. Ask your questions, and, and please help answer questions that get asked. So with that, I, I think we're going to turn it over uh, to Andrew to facilitate Q&A. Thank you, Brett, and thank you, Christian and Anoush, for your uh, for your time today. Um, so yeah, we are going to turn it over to Q&A. Um, before I open it to your questions, and there are a lot of them, so we'll do our best to get through them. Um, I, I want to ask a question each of our, our special guests from uh, from Ubico and, and Knock Knock Labs. Um, so, Derek, let's start with you. So, uh, Derek Hansen um, from Ubico. Derek's the Senior Director of Solutions Architecture and Standards at Ubico. Um, very simply, if someone is interested in building solutions that utilize FIDO authentication, where would they begin? Thanks for the question, Andrew. Uh, where I would begin is I would first be, begin looking at WebAuthn and looking at how I can add web authentication uh, protocols in, uh, as part of FIDO2 to my applications. Um, I would find the uh, right places to, to go find a community of developers that can, that can help you um, understand how to implement these protocols and how to uh, uh, develop. Um, and to that end, Ubico has launched a FIDO2 developer program, and we will be updating a lot of our content uh, in the next uh, several weeks here, showing how to develop with uh, FIDO2, how to build applications, what, why are um, certain elements required when you do uh, send a specific message. Uh, our goal is to enable the mass adoption of FIDO uh, authentication so that we can simplify the experiences uh, that everyone exists or goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the end goal here is to build a rich developer community um, that we can use to help you solve the problems that you're facing today uh, with authentication. Um, and, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll turn that back over to you, Andrew. Okay. Th thank you, Derek. Um, and, and Rolf, uh, Rolf Lindemann the Senior Director of Products and Technology at Knock Knock Labs and also uh, deeply involved in, in all of FIDO's spec development. Um, you know, Brett talked a little bit about universal server, but can you expand on this a little bit, right? So obviously you have a historic uh, UAF and, and U2F specs, now there's FIDO2. Um, do companies need three different servers? You know, where, do the, where does universal server fit into this and, and, and how do you see this evolving in the marketplace? Yeah, um, hello everyone, thank you for the question. So um, that, that's an interesting concept with the universal server, right? So, so the different protocols we have um, uh, talked about, like. FIDO2 today and, and the previous ones like U2F and UAF they have been developed um, for a certain set of use cases and, and security profiles. And now with the universal server, we make it possible that a single server implementation is supporting all the different flavors of FIDO to support all the different use cases so that you can address users using your mobile app and you can with web authentication address users using uh, the desktop and mobile web browsers. So essentially all the digital channels with a single FIDO server. And then that, that's a very powerful concept which uh, delivers on, on the, um, essentially the, the, the promise of, of the FIDO uh, specification to make sure that you can reduce the complexity of your data center by supporting a single FIDO um, universal server to, to um, let's say, have stronger and more convenient authentication across all your digital channels you want to support. Okay, thank you. 
So there's follow-up questions for either Derek or, or Ralph. Please please ask them in the uh, in the question dialog box on on your GoToWebinar client. So I'll start with some questions. Um, and if we don't get to all your questions, we will do our best to follow up by email. And if you have any further questions that come up that we either don't get to or you think of them later, you can always email us at info at FidoAlliance.org. Um, so first question, um, an explanation on how Fido is fishing resistant. So Christian, I'm going to direct this to you, uh, at least for starters. Um, how is Fido fishing resistant if malware is on your device and you use this and have a token on your device in which malware exploits? So how does Fido protect against malware exploits as it pertains to protection from phishing? Um, related question, um, the same individual would like to understand how the private key is stored from a standards perspective and, it's, and if it's recoverable, um, as that sounds like a potential weak link. Right, all, all great questions. Thanks, Andrew. So um, let me try and take all three questions here. So let's start at the phishing resistance one, right? So um, the, the way that FIDO is phishing resistant is actually pretty straightforward. Um, in addition to basically looking at a um, at the specific credential ID that gets sent down. So in other words, if you're trying to perform an authentication on a specific website, let's say I'm on paypal.com, as we saw earlier, um, the credential ID that PayPal is requesting a signature for. So uh, PayPal says, well, I need to authenticate user ABC. I have a credential ID, which is almost like a handle that's stored for a specific credential. I have this handle. I'm going to tell the phone to please produce me a signature for a specific handle or credential ID. When that gets sent down to the phone, the authenticator, the FIDO authenticator on the phone will look at the specific origin or website requesting the signature and will make sure that the same website who registered the credential ID is also the one for which the signature is being requested by simply uh, doing a comparison between the origin of registration and the origin at the time of signature. So in other words, if I'm on paypal2.com, and I try to perform a signature, um, I will not be able to perform a signature for a specific credential ID if that credential ID was registered to the real PayPal. So basically, simple origin separation is what we use in FIDO to double check that the user is indeed on the correct website, right? Um, and basically, of course, that trust is kind of inherited all the way down the stack from TLS, making sure that no one else can uh, spoof, for example, a, uh, a session or a, uh, a TLS session for a website that it doesn't have control over the SSO or TLS private key of. So kind of everything kind of inherits in the stack uh, and, and builds on top of like TLS. Um, so that's kind of the first part and that's obviously a, a pretty simple answer. Um, malware is another interesting one. Um, malware typically is out of scope of um, FIDO in general. Um, and I'll hand over to Brett to maybe talk a little bit more about this. Uh, but in, in essence, if we look at uh, at authentication in, in, inside FIDO, we try to, and kind of let's start tie the uh, answer to the third question in here as well. We try to store private keys as secure and as safely as we can on every platform and every authenticator. So for example, if I'm on a device that has a secure element or has a trusted execution environment, that is typically where we will try to store keys to try and keep it secure away from prying eyes, maybe malicious software on a device. But in essence, sophisticated malware will always be able to trick the user into doing things that they don't want to do. It just depends on the sophistication of the malware. That's why we decided, um, at least from our perspective at Google, when we do our threat modeling, we decided to leave malware almost kind of out of scope when looking at FIDO. Um, when we look at our own threat modeling, we look at remote phishing attacks. Of course, that's the most scalable type of attack and the most pervasive type of attack. That's what folks are being, like that, that's really what folks are calling for today, right? We look at Verizon data breach report of last year, it said 81% of attacks was kind of because of weak stolen password phishing related incidents those are all the remote attack line and by far the most pervasive so that's kind of the first thing that we try and protect against when we look at fido um other more specific more targeted malware uh, related attacks really they are to be solved at a different layer in the stack um, for example on android we're doing a lot of work to make sure that you know uh, 
um, unwanted applications cannot run and shouldn't be able to run. I know there's uh, a lot of work also being done on the, on the, on the Microsoft side. Uh, so we believe that malware is an attack at a different kind of level in the stack and should kind of almost be solved at that level. Um, so hopefully I also address the problem about kind of the secure key storage. Um, FIDO in general as a principle says that um, private keys should remain secure. Once they're generated, they should remain on device. Uh, there really shouldn't be a way for someone to kind of just exfiltrate private keys of registered credentials. They should remain on device. Um, so hopefully there is no weak link in that process there. Um, if you need to recover a credential, you really need to re-register that said credential with the relying party at this point in time. Thanks, Christian. Uh uh, this is Brett. Let me go ahead and jump on there a little bit. And actually, I'm going to bridge over to Rolf because Rolf's one of the co-chairs of our security requirements working group uh, who has developed the authenticator level of uh, security certification program. So the malware attacks that FIDO does concern itself with are malware that can lift that private key off the device because the, the whole model is the private key never leaves a device. So you do want to look at how best protect the private key. And Christian introduced some of the technologies that are being used to do that. And I'll turn it over to Rolf to say a little bit more about what we're looking for when we test and certify those devices and the different levels that, that we've identified. Rolf? Yes, and um, uh, thank you, Brad. Um, I think I want to reiterate first on the notion of scalable attacks. So if you look at attacks today in the internet, we see that there is one level of attack or a pattern of attacks which doesn't even involve the client, right? It's really stealing passwords from servers. And just by using FIDO, we already protect against that. The second was phishing attacks, right? A second very common pattern today. And just by using FIDO, we already protect against those. Now, this doesn't mean attackers will stop attacking, right? They will just shift their focus to something else. And this will very likely be the client device. And they might now want to extract the, the private key, right? The, the private part of the credential from your device. And, and they might want to use different technologies for that. And, and the first thing is by installing malicious software on that device, which will just try to, to get, extract that key or to try to misuse that key. And th these are attack patterns which we cover in our um, authenticator certification program. So we have different levels, essentially three different buckets. In the first bucket, it's the best thing you can do just on top of the rich operating system. If um, you do not have support from the, let's say, the operating system vendor or the, the device uh, vendor itself. And the second level is essentially what you can do if you have uh, substantial support from the device vendor itself a level which can protect against all malware, uh, can protect the key against malware which runs on that device um, to, to, to make sure that, that the key can't be extracted at least. And there is a, a third level where even physical attacks on that device, right, and to just assume you switch your device off or you, you lose your security key, someone finds it on the street and now he wants to crack out the keys and to impersonate you as a user. And you can even protect against those on that uh, left side. Right? This is what we call physical attacks, where people in, in, a, in a lab, right, try to um, um, open the, the uh, decap the chips, right, with a microscope, can look into the detail and all that stuff. So very expensive, very sophisticated attacks, but there is technology to protect against that. And that's a class in, in, in the higher um, levels of the authenticator certification program, which we can protect against as well. So it's very important to understand all this, uh, these three different classes and that the, the baseline is already protecting against the most um, or the dominating um, scalable attacks today, which is stealing passwords from servers or using phishing attacks just by using FIDO on that. And maybe one word more to what can you do if you have to authorize a high value banking transaction, right? Sometimes authenticators even have a secure display. So there are technologies uh, like that. And I think even Android P now uh, so supports um, that, that feature. It's just uh, called a, um, high assurance, whatever um, user authorization or so. So there's a different term for that. But the concept is the same to make sure that whenever you use the authenticator, it's just 
it's not only asking for the user gestures, also displaying something to the user in a secure way, which can leverage um, certain security technologies, either on that separate security key or inside a device like a smartphone, if, to you, uh, if you use that uh, technology there, to make sure that at least high-value transactions, you, you get the, what you see is what you sign, right? the, the user really knows what he is doing and can reject a malicious transaction and, and, and doesn't get tricked into uh, approving something he doesn't want. So there are different things, and that's all covered by the FIDO Authenticator Certification Program. Super. Ralph, thanks for that added explanation. Um, so we have a couple of questions on certification. Um, so I want to kind of touch on this, a question around when will universal certification be available, when will we be certifying uh, um, FIDO 2 authenticators. Uh, so you know, FIDO certification is based on a interoperability testing. Um, we anticipate the first interop tests uh, taking place in the next, I'd say, se several weeks, so six to eight weeks. Um, stay tuned on our website and our email um, for updates on when, when that will take place. Uh, here's a question I want to ask. Uh, hi, providing I use PayPal from both my Android phone and my Windows 10 computer, do I use the same key pair on both devices? If not, can a server use several key pairs for the same identity? So how, how do I manage if I'm, if I'm accessing the same site, same service from, from multiple devices? Who wants to take that one? Um, I'm happy to take this, Richard. Uh, I, like, uh, let me take this one quickly. So, um, in essence, that's why it's important that we specifically look at this use case as a re-authentication use case. In other words, the user already signed into PayPal at some point in time on the machine using some credential. Um, at that point in time, the um, a brand new FIDO credential was registered on that machine in question, so either on the Android phone or the Windows uh, PC. Um, at that point, the FIDO credential was registered, so it is correct that there is one FIDO credential per machine that the user is using, but that FIDO credential is tied to the session that the user has on that specific machine. So, for example, in this case, um, the way that we think about this is when you log into a remote service, let's say PayPal, for example, you get a cookie back. Um, at that point in time, you get the user to hopefully opt in to FIDO authentication on that specific machine. Uh, you register a brand new credential for that machine. You get back a credential ID. You put the credential ID in the cookie, or you annotate it in such a way that that credential ID is specifically associated with that machine. So you're right that if you end up using five machines, you end up having five different FIDO credentials, but that credential is only actively used on the specific machine that you're on where you already have a session. So for example, if you're signing in from the Android device, the cookie on Android will tell the backend server that, hey, I'm on the Android device right now. When you try to challenge me using FIDO, you should challenge me with the credential ID for the Android device and vice versa on the Windows machine. If I'm on Windows uh, and I try to do a transaction, the cookie should tell PayPal that, hey, I'm on the Windows machine right now. Please challenge me with the credential ID for the Windows machine. Um, and if those cookies expire or the user deletes them and they're not being used for a while, you can almost treat these credential IDs as ephemeral. In other words, they can kind of be wiped out after some period of inactivity. And the next time around, the user will just have to re-authenticate uh, using some other mechanism to the platform if they end up coming back. But it's important to note that these things, in this demo at least, is specifically tied to the authenticated session on that machine. Um, and the remote party has a relationship with the specific device that you're interacting on. Um, so multiple credential IDs uh, and multiple key pairs. So each one of the machines have its own key pair and credential ID. I don't know if anyone else wants to also jump in on this one. Yeah, this Brett, I'll just jump in to say that's that's kind of a you know web authen without CTAP scenario. Um, if you have a CTAP authenticator, whether that's your smartphone that you're using as your roaming authenticator across different machines. Uh, so that smartphone that you registered the key pair on, you can use that as your external authenticator from your PC. You don't have to re-register keys on the PC or, of course, security key as demonstrated earlier today. So I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that, but that's just a different, it's a different result. The question did imply they've registered credentials on all these different devices. I just wanted to point out there's an alternative, which is register all your credentials on your portable device and use that across all your other devices. So you don't have to re-register. Yeah, and then maybe one addition to that, it's important to understand the difference between the user's identity, right? All the authenticators or credentials are tied to the same user identity. And the authenticator, 
or the credential source, if you will, uh, which gives you all the, the keys. And um, that's a very powerful concept to use different keys on different authenticators because then you know about the characteristic of that authenticator and, and the protection and the assurance level you get by, by using that authenticator, and uh, which is tied to, to that credential. That's so a very powerful concept which allows you, and as a user gives you control to deregister certain authenticators which you do not use or have lost uh, potentially and, and, and still continue uh, using the others. Yeah, and, and I would like to add that um, in, in general, one of the conversations I have very frequently is people are learning about uh, about web authentication, they're learning about CTAP, they're, they're beginning to understand what does this mean to implement, is that there is a, a fundamental shift in how we view credentials and accounts. Uh, traditionally, uh, we have viewed, you know, you have one account, you have one password. And in this uh, new world of FIDO authenticators, you will have one account, but you may have many credentials. You may have credentials that are uh, registered on an external authenticator like a YubiKey. You could have credentials on a phone. You could have credentials in a platform. And it's the, it's the use, usage of those credentials that is going to um, allow us to build seamless experiences for users. The, the underlying rules where we uh, talked earlier about how those credentials are stored and the security requirements around how those keys are stored are what gives uh, you as, a, as a, a building a relying party service, gives you the benefits and the, uh, the assurance that these credentials meet the requirements I need for delivering this application to my users. Um, and it's it's really it's the beginning of that shift away from one user one password to one user and many authenticators that allow user choice and behavior based upon the um, scenario that is necessary to deliver the application. Okay, great. Um, so just so everyone knows, we, we still have literally dozens of questions. Um, so we're not going to get to everybody. We're, we're going to do our best to get as many as many in as we can in this hour, and then we'll, again we'll answer any questions by email as follow up. We'll try to coordinate that because we do have a log of all the questions and, and get back to you by email um, as soon as we can following the webinar. Um, here's a question: uh, How does CTAP get in my smartphone? Um, so basically, how, you know, how does the, how does the device become FIDO enabled? Uh, to, to, to leverage CTAP in the, in the smartphone form factor. Um, so I'll, I'll I guess, that one since I guess this is more of an Android question as we look at the demo today here. Um, I mean, there's multiple ways, and I'm sure Brett will also kind of chime in on, on this one. Um, from the Android perspective, I mean, um, we as Google have the um, Basically, our inclination is that this should be as widely available as possible. And of course, there's multiple layers and multiple ways that which the smartphone can become FIDO enabled. I mean, it can be as a library inside a specific application. It can be something a specific OEM decides to do for their brand of phones. Um, the way that we're looking at this right now at Google is saying, we would like this to be as widely available as possible. So obviously that means we can add it to kind of the fundamental Android fabric on the device. Um, which means that all devices that are running Android from the certain version onwards, of course, will have this capability. Um, the demo that we've done earlier uh, here today shows that functionality kind of built in at the Android level of the phone. This has not been publicly launched yet, uh, but it is something that we are working towards. Um, so um, hopefully at some point in time, we will start seeing phones at the Android level have the capability of doing um, FIDO and web then kind of almost natively uh, with what you get from the phone when you buy it from, uh, from, from a vendor. And for everybody else, uh, you know, the, the mobile OS is not currently uh, shipping or, or planning to ship FIDO authentication capabilities natively out of the box, you can use SDKs from FIDO certified vendors like Knock Knock Labs um, to add it for like uh, iPhones, right? So that's how uh, I'm a customer of Bank of America. You might recall that they were one of the deployers of FIDO authentication we talked about earlier. And um, when I use my iPhone, my, even my Face ID authenticator is doing FIDO. And it's doing FIDO because Bank of America put that capability in their app. 
um, not because Apple built it into the device the way Google is starting to with Android. So there's a way to reach um, all your users. Uh, and the universal server is one way to be sure that um, you can you can reach all of them. Thanks. That, that hit on some questions we also had about uh, web versus na native app support. So thank you, Brett. Um, Brett, here's a question for you. Is there a plan to leverage FIDO with EMV 3D, 3DS2 or vice versa? So maybe some comments on how we're engaging with EMV Co. Sure. So one of the things that I try to emphasize when talking about payments is FIDO credentials are not payment credentials. FIDO credentials are authentication. So that credit card number, FIDO is not like replacing the credit card number or the tokenization of the credit card number. Um, so FIDO is, it feels like your payment credential when your payment service is a wallet and all I have to do is authenticate to my PayPal account and I make a payment. You know, so sometimes people get it conflated. FIDO is the authentication credential to a service. Um, in the case of, of EMV, however, where those are the payment credentials, right? That's the payment card industry's standards for the, uh, the PAN and tokenization of that PAN, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have been partnering with EMV Co. And what, what, what they're looking for is card holder verification, right? So uh, if anyone who knows how the payment industry works knows there's a liability shift on whether it's card holder present or a cardholder not present, uh, which comes along with um, a, you know, a difference in transactions. So uh, transaction cost. So it's a big deal uh, in the payment industry. And what EMV Co has been working with us on is to say, well, hey, if there's a FIDO authenticator and they're specifically started working with us on the mobile phone case, mobile phone checkout at physical point of sale. It was like, if there's a FIDO authenticator on that phone, then couldn't we trust that to have done a good job of verifying that the cardholder is present, the correct cardholder is present. And that is the nature of our collaboration with them. And the short answer is yes. And we've gone through all their requirements and, and FIDO authenticators meet all of their requirements and actually inspired, there was one piece of functionality that they wanted for a really easy uh, user experience. Um, and you know, since Ralph authored that piece of functionality, I'll let him answer what that one thing is that we've added. Ralph? Yes, so there, there was one request that essentially you want to make sure that a user can be authenticated in transactions in a very, let's say, frictionless way. And sometimes you, you might, might have experienced that when you do the, um, the um, NFC kind of payment, uh, contactless payment today, there's a, a threshold like $20, 20 euro, whatever it is, depends on the country where you uh, just tap your device and, and, and you have authenticated that thing. And we modeled that similarly so that an authenticator could verify the user, so require an extra user verification step like a fingerprint and a verification in, in a certain time period. But when you do another transaction in a short time uh, period after that, um, uh, you can reuse or leverage the user verification which, which happened previously because it's still the same user with, with a relatively high likelihood on that device. And we call that a user verification caching. So that's a very powerful concept which makes it more practical to verify the user without, let's say, overloading the user, putting too much friction on the user and to touch the fingerprint sensor too often, especially when you do multiple transactions in a, in a short time frame. This, so what Brett just des described is, is one angle we have done with EMVCO. If you look into the EMVCO 3D Secure version 2.1 specification, it already mentions FIDO there that if the e-commerce, right, if you look at the 3D Secure flow, there's a lot of different things involved. And the first is the user somehow authenticates to the e-commerce vendor and then the e-commerce vendor talks to the, to, to the payment um, uh, in the network in, in some way. Right, and, and the e-commerce vendor essentially can t tell the payment network, oh, I authenticated the user using FIDO. And this already reduces the likelihood of, of triggering that, um, let's say, this uh, additional user challenge, right? But typically, in the past, they started with asking you user for a static password to authorize a account not present payment. And then they switched over to, to a, a SMS OTP code, at least in certain uh, um, geographies. And they found out with the static passwords, they have a card abandonment rate of 30%. 
Now we're switching over to SMS OTP. They could reduce that to 15%, but it's still seen too high. And so especially in Europe, now MasterCard, for example, mandates the use of biometric user verification starting next year in April, so 2019 in April. They publicly stated that already um, because that reduces the card abandonment rate to down to 3%. And that's another point where FIDO comes in. So essentially the third point, right, if you ask um, the user to authenticate that, that challenge, if that challenge is needed, right, with biometric, with FIDO authentication, you can reduce the friction so that users do not forget the password, right, and are not um, um, so um, penalized by in entering the password that they uh, abandon the, the card transaction. They will just continue that. And, and so these three d different ways are good examples how FIDO clucks into the EMV goes reduce secure specification. Right, so some things, so, um, the authentication to the e-commerce vendor, which can be reported to the payment network industry, which is already part of the is really secure specification. The second is if a, um, a, a cardholder challenge is required, you can use FIDO at, at that stage as opposed to SMS, OTP, or static passwords. And the third one is what Brett just mentioned, to, to use the um, uh, consumer device cardholder verification method and integrate with FIDO and what we have done with user verification caching on that front. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Anoush, we're getting several questions about um, Microsoft support, uh, Active Directory support for FIDO for I internal and enterprise uh, internal user authentication. Can you expand a little bit or kind of share some details on how Microsoft will be supporting this um, within Active Directory? Absolutely. So in at RSA, we announced the availability of support for FIDO within Azure Active Directory. Uh, so what we can do with uh, the bit that just came out is ability to pick up um, a FIDO authenticator like a Ubico key or a YubiKey and take it with you to any PC in your environment that is connected to Azure Active Directory and be able to log in with that dongle. And uh, this is a PC you've never been before, right? So it's a kind of a, have a portable credential story with you that you can roam across different devices. And once you log in, then SSO will kick in and you can sign into any of Office 365 um, resources. So that's the story we're telling with, with these remote devices. And basically, we're putting this together as a, as a way to go passwordless, right? On the same device, once you log in with, a, with an external FIDO 2.0 device, uh, you could potentially set up Windows Hello, uh, which is the platform authenticator. And once you set it up, then you can start using Windows Hello as a way to interact with the device and get the same SSO. So basically, the idea is to you know use the FIDO technology to provide a truly passwordless story for um, Azure Active Directory users. Um, and we're working on expanding that to uh, support scenarios where the environment is a hybrid mode, where you both have contents that are protected by cloud identity or contents protected by um, uh, domain um, credentials. Um, but basically, that's that's how we look at FIDO for uh, commercial enterprise uh, users. Okay. Question here. Um, th thanks, Anish. Um, when CTAP's used and deployed as a smartphone authenticator for logging into a website on a PC, how does that communication happen? Uh, does the smartphone actually uh, talk directly to the PC using Bluetooth, or does it communicate through a back channel uh, through the smartphone's own internet or cellular connection? Christian, you want to take that? I can briefly talk I'm, to the Yeah, go ahead, Christian, if you want to take it. I'm, I'm sorry, you guys just break up for a quick second. Here. Can someone just repeat the question? Be happy to talk about it. How does how does a C, C tap on a smartphone? How does that smartphone communicate with the with the web browser, with with the website on right. on a PC? So that could either be a, oh. a Christian question or an, an news question. Okay, so I, I mean I will give you my quick answer and then we can hand over back to Anush here. Um, so the idea is that that communication can happen over any one of the supported transports that C tap supports today, and of course C tap being the client to device. Uh, Authent or the client authenticator protocol, which is the incurred device protocol between a desktop machine, for example, and a mobile phone. Um, CTAP has multiple transports defined, uh, USB, VLE, NFC. Um, 
So any one of those protocols can technically be used. The phone can either be attached if the phone supports that, or most likely the protocol that um, we're working on uh, here at Google will be the Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol. Um, so there will be a Bluetooth Low Energy link between the um, device and the uh, um, the mobile device and the and the machine. Um, and the local connectivity is really, really important with that phishing resistance we spoke about earlier. Any kind of situation where the communication is brokered via the cloud um, can potentially result in a uh, phishing um, kind of user sneaking in uh, or, or a bad guy, a, a malicious actor. Um, so because there's kind of local proximity guaranteed by the local proximity protocols, that still guarantees your phishing resistance. Uh, Anush, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Nope, right on. Okay, thank you. So one last question. So uh, Brady, do you mind going back one slide to the uh, the resources page? Um, so before I ask Brett, you know, kind of a wrap up question here. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions still remaining. You know, th this link here, our, our FIDO dev forum is an active community. Um, so that's the, the first sub bullet. Fidolance.org slash participate slash community. I'd encourage you, you know, to take your questions that have not been answered, and we may even put them in there ourselves, um, and, and ask them in that forum, because it is an active community of, of FIDO experts, both members and non-members alike. It's a great place to, to get these questions answered by your peers. Um, if any of you have vendor-specific questions, I'm seeing questions for Ubico, for Knock Knock, for Microsoft. Um, you can email info at Fidoalliance.org or email me at Andrew at Fidoalliance.org. And I'll forward those on to the appropriate representatives from these companies. Um, so, Brett, we have several questions around. You know, the demo showed passwords. Um, the, the the webinar is called Beyond Passwords. Can you kind of talk about you know what we're doing here and you know, how the demos are actually helping augment passwords and kind of find overall mission on reducing reliance on passwords as we move forward in the marketplace? Sure, so job one is to not be dependent on passwords to provide security. All flavors of FIDO meet that, that demand. So whether you're doing uh, using a FIDO external device as a second factor on top of password, or you're replacing the password with that embedded biometric, or now with FIDO2, a multi-factor self-contained external security key, you are no longer dependent on the password for security. In fact, when you use a security key in a second factor mode, all you're really doing using the username and password for is kind of letting the server know what account you're trying to get into. The security is coming from the cryptographic verification on the device. So that's step one. Step two would be, you know, remove the password entirely from the user experience, right? Because we're trying to improve the user experience as well. And you can see where we're headed there. Um, you, you're seeing a lot of biometric uh, adoption. It, essentially, think of it this way. Whatever I do to unlock my device, um, I'll now be able to just do that, whatever that is. And that comes down to user choice. It comes down to market innovation. Whatever that is, if I'm drawing a pattern on my screen or I'm typing in a code, whatever I want as a user to do to unlock my device, that's all I have to do from that point forward to authenticate to my applications and my websites. Um, and then, you know, the role of the security key uh, really helping get you onto new devices um, and be that you that authenticator that you always have and you don't have to be dependent on what your device may or may not support at that time. So I think we're well on our way. We've we've already gotten past the security problems of passwords, whatever you see FIDO deployed, you're no longer vulnerable to those security problems of passwords. And soon we'll scrub out uh, the, 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 the need for the user to even use a password, type of password, uh, including security keys, which now with FIDO2 can be multi-factor on their own. Awesome. Good. So, so that, that's, that's a great answer, Brent. And thanks so much. And, and so with that, let's, let's wrap things up for this webinar. Um, again, thank you all for attending today. This was actually a record number of, uh, of registrants for webinar and attendees. So, so thank you all so much for your interest. Um, please do take a couple minutes to fill out the survey. Um, and then again, if you have follow-up questions, please do send them by info at FIDOalliance.org or to the FIDO Dev Forum. So thanks again. We'll look forward to catching you on a future FIDO webinar. Thank you.